Good day all. Uh, my name is Henry Clifford. I'm a senior coffee trader at the UL Wakefield and thank you for joining. Today is day two of a five-day uh, online free webinar series as part of Full Circle. Um, for those of you that don't know, Full Circle is a um, event that DO Wakefield started about two years ago and the idea was to connect people um, within our supply chain. Um, DO Wakefield's been going for many years now, this is our 50th anniversary year and we're very proud of the relationship we've built up uh, in the previous decades. So the idea of this week is to connect people and share knowledge. Because of coronavirus um, we had to reorganize uh, Full Circle. It was supposed to be a physical event uh, this Friday in fact, but we decided to take it online. So every single recording uh, uh, webinar will be recorded, so if you for whatever reason can't make the whole thing and want to come back to it, this will be published online next week. And every day is a different topic from a different speaker from a different country. So we've decided on a few topics, we hope you enjoy them. And at the end of the event, I'll be talking about a beekeeping project that we're supporting in Peru uh, in conjunction with this event. So I'm gonna stop talking now and I'm gonna pass you on to uh, Philip Searle, a senior coffee trader at DR Wakefield. He's gonna say a few things about himself and then introduce our speaker, Nishant. On, over to you, Phil. Uh, good morning, all. Um, yeah, as Henry said, I'm Philip Searle, one of the senior traders at DR Wakefield. Uh, I've been there for around, well, next week will be my eighth birthday at DR Wakefield. So many more years to get to the 50th year like D.O. Wakefield, but um, yeah, I'd just like to int introduce uh, Nishant. Um, he's the owner of Seth Rahman Estate. Uh, Seth Rahman Estate we have dealt with since 2011. And not only is um, Seth Rahman one of the top farms in India, it, it's one of the top farms in the world. So it's a pleasure to have Nishant with us. Thank and uh, very much looking forward to hearing all about his farm and brain yeah. Nishan, I think I'll pass the mic over to you, if you'd like sure. to begin. Uh, good day to everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us on uh, this wonderful journey. Um, thank you to Digar Wakefield and team for having me as one of the speakers for these series of webinars, uh, which is part of the full circle of 2020. I wish and pray that everyone who's listening in is safe from this pandemic, which is affecting the whole world. And uh, over the past, uh, over the next 25 minutes, I will try and uh, recreate what we have done in uh, Seturaman Estate over the past 25 years. Uh, it's, it's not going to be easy, but uh, I'll, I'll just take you on a small journey as to why uh, we did what we did and uh, where we stand as of today and uh, what could be the, uh, the roadmap ahead going uh, for for a farm like ours. Um, so thank you once again for joining us. Can I have the next slide, please? Um, so uh, just to give you a small background as to where we are located, what we are all about, uh, we are based in uh, Chikmangalur district, which is uh, the premier growing district of coffee in India. Um, between, uh, uh, it's, it's about 300, my farm is about 300 kilometers uh, from the city of Bangalore. Uh, some of you all may have visited Bangalore and know it because it's, it's the IT hub uh, of the world. Uh, so although I'm based out of Bangalore, but my farm is 300 kilometers, so I travel up and down quite often. Uh, it's a family owned farm. Uh, it's been in our family for more than 200 years and I'm a sixth generation uh, coffee grower. Uh, I, I, I'm actually an engineer and a master's in business administration and I took over the farm in September of 1995. So that's why I said uh, the journey of 25 years. Um, it's located, I mean, uh, some of you all may be aware now, we are talking more about eco hotspots and things like that as climate change is, is upon us and uh, there are a lot of, uh, you know, uh, things which are happening which nature is telling us that, you know, it needs to heal and we are based in uh, a very sensitive area of the world called the Western Ghats. And it's one of the few hotspots in the world. And uh, some of you all may be aware what a hotspot is, but still, uh, just for the benefit of everyone, a hotspot is potentially an area where if we do something crazy, like you can see that uh, on that uh, 
slide, that's exactly where my farm is located. Uh, where you can see a bit of brown area is all where the building, the infrastructure, the office, the drying patios, the wet mill. We are also putting up a dry mill uh, this year. It should have been functional as we speak, but uh, because of the pandemic and uh, unfortunately uh, some of the challenges of logistics, we, that uh, project has been uh, put on hold and hopefully by the end of 2020, the uh, dry mill should also be ready. So all that brown area, what you see around there is all the uh, infrastructure that we have on the farm. But all the other green area is all coffee. Uh, those are the shade trees of the coffee and uh, they are all native shade trees. We don't have any other trees that have been um, brought in which are not native. We grow a lot of fruit trees as, uh, as uh, intercrops. Uh, I won't call it intercrops. They are actually there for, for years and we actually grow coffee under them. And uh, the Echo Hotspot is something that we, we take great pride in preserving and looking after. So the coffee which comes out of my farm is actually grown under the shade of these beautiful trees. So it's just it's just a it's it's actually an aerial view of uh, the farm, just to give you an idea. We we practice all the traditional uh, uh, practices of growing coffee, as in we we, we it's all shade grown. Uh, there's no coffee in my farm which is open, uh, although it's robusta. Robusta loves loves the sun and uh, needs a lot more sunlight than an Arabica farm does. But still, we have taken a conscious decision that we need all the shade that is possible, and especially because we have a lot of bird life and animal life on our farm, and we take great pride. In fact, you can see the logo of my farm is of a peacock. We have plenty of peacocks on our farm, and also peacock is synonymous with India because it's the national bird of India. So we wanted uh, the peacock to be part of our, uh, you know, our entire story because it's a beautiful bird uh, when it's does its rain dance it's something beautiful to look at and our farm uh, kind of um, let's say the, the the spirit of the peacock is there in the farm because it's it's truly an indian uh, bird for everyone to look out for it's uh, coffee grown on the farm is 100 percent eco-friendly and ethically farm we have uh, we follow all the rules and bylaws that are mandated by the government but not only that we go one step forward uh, we don't do anything that could harm our workers or for that matter my co-workers or my uh, or uh, people who are on the farm not just the human life but even bird life and animal life so so we've actually taken a very conscious decision over the last uh, maybe five to six years where we've gone organic uh, some parts of my farm are certified organic parts of my farm are not certified organic but we've gone organic there's been no pesticide, no weedicide, no herbicide, none of that has been sprayed on my farm for more than five years. Um, we've got our coffees analyzed for that. And uh, in fact, um, happy to note that the lab in Germany, which did the analysis of my coffee bean, came back saying it's probably one of the cleanest beans they've, they've actually analyzed in years. So uh, it's, 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 some, it's, it's a decision we have taken because I feel that it's our way of giving back to nature and our way of trying to kind of slow down this uh, climate change that is upon us. And uh, one way of doing it is trying to go back to the roots. And that's what we've been doing for the last five years. Can I have the next slide, please? Uh, the next slide, Phil. Yeah, just... Yeah, um, now coming back to, um, I think there's one slide in between this or? Um, Henry's in control of this. So I'll have to... yeah, I've got, okay, got... yeah, that, that's got... fine. Uh, so so that, that that's a robusta for you. I mean, a uh, lot of y'all probably are aware of Arabica. Y'all have been to Arabica farms. I don't know how many of y'all have been to robusta farms, but that's, that's the right robusta cherries. Uh, green as well as the bush. It's it's a much more vibrant bush, a bigger bush, holds a lot more cherries, is much more productive, but has always been the enigmatic child of coffee, as in uh, either people love it or hate it. And uh, I've had more hate about coffee than uh, love, but in the last maybe four to five years, again, things are changing. I know that a lot of roasters are open to using Robusta. I know that a lot of specialty roasters who had built up their business and saying that they were 100% uh, Arabica, I've started uh, using Robusta. 
and uh, they are paying as much as some of the finest arabicas in the world i mean uh, probably there would be a day when a fine cup of robusta would finally make its uh, uh, let's say let's say in the auctions where you know more, maybe a, a dollar i mean a hundred dollars per pound kind of thing is possible i mean and uh, this was one of the things that i had to take a decision when i came to the farm 25 years back we had both arabica and robusta on the farm and uh, i'm sure a lot of you um, who have done business administration would have heard of the term swot analysis uh, swot stands for s stands for strength w for weakness a for opportunities uh, i mean o for opportunities and p for threats and i did a swot analysis of my uh, farm and i realized that i could be a average uh, arabica producer or because uh, robusta does so well on our farm that we could actually push the boundaries of robusta and try and see what we could do and take this to another level in terms of quality and not just of productivity but in quality because i'm very keen to break the uh, glass ceiling so to say when it comes to uh, robusta coffee and that was something that i said about many many years back it's been a, it, it was difficult initially uh, i remember going to a lot of uh, uh, the specialty coffee shows both in europe and america and uh, meeting all these specialty traders um, of course uh, wakefield has been at the forefront of us uh, uh, you know uh, buying our specialty coffee and supporting sethuraman estate for more than 9 years now but uh, we didn't have too many people back then now we have a whole bunch of people who buy from different countries so it was the enigmatic child of coffee and it still remains to a certain extent with a lot of uh, roasters and uh, that was the reason why this r certification was initiated by cqi it was a follow up on the q certification which was done by initially which was done by cqi as all of you all are aware uh, probably a lot of you all who are on this uh, webinar are also q graders or r graders or have definitely bought some coffees or cups of coffees which are q coffees or or, or coffees which are supposed to be you know the high end of the arabica uh, spectrum uh, robusta actually uh, uh, also uh thanks to a few uh, dedicated uh, uh coffee lovers got together and said that why don't we create a similar platform for robusta and uh, i think it was with the help of the ugandan government and uh, with cqi they set about for many years i think it took them about 2 or 3 years to come back with protocols as to what would be a quality robusta how they would go about it what would be the parameters to judge robusta because obviously robusta has totally different a taste profile compared to arabica so they had to decide on what they could do as a uh, uh, you know what would be the protocols and uh, finally how they would cup it and how they would score it so it took them a while and uh, then they finally launched it i think in the year 2000 towards the end of 2011 and uh, it just so happened i i happened to be at one of these uh, launch events which happened in uh, initially first in, in in america and then in europe and uh, since i was uh, talking to a lot of these uh, specialty copy uh, people they said uh, you know we are coming out with the r certificate and things like that and i was pretty excited because finally there was a platform for robusta to say it's quality and um, in 2012 i sent up my very first sample and uh, lo and behold that was the very first sample that was ever graded and got the certificate Uh, of being a R coffee. Now, what I mean by R coffee is uh, uh, these samples have to be sent. Those days there were only two or three labs which were doing these uh, grading and cupping of these coffees. Uh, I sent it to America to the SCAA uh, office in Long Beach, and they in turn then uh, sent it to, uh, of course, anonymous to different cuppers over the world. And these cuppers had to score these coffees and get back to them and. Uh, only coffees which get 80 points and above are classified as r coffees or we get the certificate you can proudly display it on your bag of course uh, you can't display it on every single bag because it comes either from a lot you have to declare what is the lot size so you can put it on your bag you can sell it as specialty coffee and more importantly uh, finally the word started getting out there so that was the uh, journey of the very first r certificate that we got after that i've been regularly sending my coffees for uh, uh cupping to, to find out where we stand and uh, uh as on date 15 coffees from my farm have been certified as r coffees or we have got the certificate for 15 farms 
I mean, 15 copies. And the world, uh, from what I uh, what I made to understand, there are less than 30 copies which have ever been given a certificate. This is the journey from 2012 to 2020. So we're talking about 15 of these copies coming from my farm out of less than 30. And we're very proud of it. We strive harder. We, we want to push the envelope and take those 1%, those small 1%, which go a huge, huge way in making sure that the quality of these copies are absolutely uh, top class. And uh, my team along with me have been focused only on quality. We sell our coffees only on quality and we're very proud of the fact that our farm was the very first art certified farm in the world. The coffee which came out of my farm was got the art certificate. And uh, like I said, only 15 coffees, uh, I mean, only 30, less than 30 in the world and 15 of them from my farm. More importantly, I feel that uh, uh, the people who cup these coffees have set very stringent measures because they wanted Robusta, the, the coffees which got the certificate to be really something special. Because I think uh, they wanted to prove to the world that uh, Robusta can be quality coffee and I think the R certificate program has gone a long way to do that. Uh, can I have the next slide please? So, uh, so there we go. These are some of the coffees that we uh, produce. Like I mentioned earlier, the very first R certified coffee in the world came out in 2012. And to date, we have about 15 of these R certified coffees which have come out of our farm. We only process very high end gourmet uh, coffees. These are all based on bias specifications. When I mean bias specifications, uh, let's say Wakefield has a particular requirement of how my coffee should taste. And we process, we know from which area of the farm and we process the coffees based on the requirement of Wakefield so that it, um, so that these coffees taste the way they should so that they can then sell it to the roasters who finally use them. Similar thing, let's say in Australia, we, my Australian buy has a totally different requirement, say compared to what Europe requires or what Wakefield requires. My American buyers have something different. So we customize coffees based on the requirement. Sometimes we, we uh, change the taste profile as per the requirement of the buyers. Uh, we, we, I've spent a lot of time on, uh, uh, on the farm in terms of processing, how we can play around with fermentation times, how we can play around with aerobic and anaerobic fermentation. And uh, we kind of have that part of it sorted out. So based on the requirement, we, we play a lot on these uh, aspects. And I think uh, because of having a full-fledged lab in-house, where we cup every single lot which comes out of, of my patio. We are able to uh, figure out where this coffee would be a good fit. So if someone asks for samples, uh, pre-shipment samples or samples before they place an order, I would know what to send to whom based on his, his or her requirement. So I think that that's a huge role that we have developed over, over the last uh, maybe 10 years where we have spent a lot of time in-house on getting our, our lab work done, getting a uh, are cupping people in place, getting the quality control team in place and ensuring and the quality control team is not just sitting in the lab. Uh, the quality control starts right from when we start uh, irrigating the coffee because what I strongly believe is the quality of the berry is what actually makes a very, very good cup of coffee. It's like I can, I can probably give an excellent piece of meat to a Michelin uh, uh, rated uh, chef and he can they turn out something exotic but if you give him a very average piece of meat he can only do so much with it so similarly with uh, my cherries if i have extremely good cherries which are well looked after and which are healthy which have been given all the nutritional support and requirement in addition to having the least amount of let's say uh, insects or pest uh, load on them they really can give you some exotic uh, tasting coffees and then it becomes easy for me to just process these coffees on on my uh, processing area, and we do different. We do we do washed, we do naturals, we do honey processed based on the requirement. Like I said, of any one of our uh, buyers, sometimes we have done uh, different levels of uh, honey and different levels of naturals. Um, again, all all based on requirements because we don't uh, we don't actually. Uh, make the coffees and then start looking around for buyers. We do it the other way around. We actually meet most of our buyers before we start with the harvest. We try and find out what exactly they want for the year because obviously the taste profile of some of our buyers change over a period of time. 
and we try and meet those requirements. So that that that's something which is very unique to our farm. And uh, we've been, I mean, I, I should say that my team has been extremely, extremely diligent on this because we have been, we have popping notes and records for the last more than 10 years when we started this journey. Uh, the next slide, please. Uh, again, uh, coming back to this, so like I said, we use both traditional measures as well as some of the modern measures. Uh, some of these terms may be uh, familiar with the, uh, some of my, some of you all listening in, some of it may not be. So let me quickly go through it. Um, how many of you all may or may have not heard of a Brix meter? A Brix meter primarily tells me the amount of dissolved sugars that is there on my plant. Now we don't just use it. I know a lot of uh, growers who uh, use Brix meters or a brick meter to find out the amount of dissolved sugars in the fruit or the cherry so that whether it's ripe enough to be harvested and if it is ripe enough to be harvested can it be made a natural or a washed or whatever it would be. We start uh, we start using a brick meter much earlier. We start using it actually at the leaf stage. Uh, every week uh, to every fortnight we have different areas of the farm where we bring in the leaf. The leaf is crushed. The, the juice, the, the sap is then put on a brick meter and tells me the amount of sugars that are there in the leaf. And uh, if if my sugar content in the leaf is below, say, 14, 14 is a number that I aim for in coffee, uh, robusta coffee again. I'm not sure about Arabica, but I'm talking about my farm just to get the record straight. We look at 14 minimum. If it is below 14, then I, then I know that I am looking at a, a scenario where the plant is not healthy enough because it is not producing enough of uh, sugars. And uh, because of the fact that it's not producing enough of food, um, there is a possibility of having a, a, either a fungal infection or a pest attack. So I need to take corrective measures. So this is some sort of, it's like going in for a blood test where before uh, something uh, you know can go wrong, you try and correct it. So we do this with our, uh, with our plants. We do it with, with the coffee. We do it regularly. Sometimes if there's an issue, we could do it every week, but we try and aim for a fortnight where we check the sugar or the food content in the leaf. And based on that, we take corrective foliar sprays uh, wherever possible because there'll be just minor ones. If not, sometimes it could be a larger uh, issue where we may need to add uh, you know, organic matter or calcium or whatever it is to the soil. The second one, which has gained a lot of importance of it, especially uh, in the world has been the glyphosate problem. Uh, we have not used glyphosate in my farm for more than five years. Uh, we got it tested, like I said, it's clean, absolutely squeaky clean. We have no traces of glyphosate on any of the beans. And uh, that's another unique thing that um, we are very proud of. We are, we are using more uh, traditional methods where we are actually growing cover crops and uh, the cover crops act both as uh, retention for the topsoil and also add to the fertility of the uh, soil. So that's that's another area that we have worked on uh, over the last five years, where we have done away with using any chemicals to control the weeds, and we have uh, started using cover crops. And cover crops have worked extremely, extremely well on our area. We have also invested a lot in uh, drip irrigation on the farm. And uh, the drip irrigation uh, concept has been around for a while. So uh, we do fertigation, that is we, we premix certain um, fertilizers, again, uh, organic fertilizers with the water, and we give small dedicated amounts of uh, these fertilizers to the uh, soil so that the plant is healthy, happy, and gives me beautiful cherries, which then I can process and then ship it to different parts of the world where all of you all can enjoy this wonderful robusta coffee. Another thing that we have done, uh, like I said, apart from the bricks meter, we do is cell sap, leaf, and soil analysis. This is extremely, extremely important. This is uh, something like, uh, like I said, like a blood test. Uh, gives me the exact status of all the nutrients uh, in, in my soil, in my leaf, and in the cell sap. So sometimes they, they could be an excess of a nutrient in the soil, but it could be deficient in the leaf. And uh, we try and figure out why that has happened and uh, how by using, um, uh, you know, there could be some sort of a blockage which has happened that it's not going in from the soil to the leaf. And we try and rectify that. It could be a deficiency of, of an element which the plant requires. 
or there could be some issue like uh, clogging of water or maybe it's too dry or uh, maybe a pest attack or things like that. So we try and sort those issues out. And uh, the final is the cell sap. So what is there in the soil and the leaf? If it has not entered the uh, entered the plant, that is the, the cell, and if you're not able to get the, uh, the same amount of uh, percentage of, let's say, nitrogen in my cell sap, then again, I'm in trouble. So we try and do all three together. This is all in-house, by the way. It, um, the soil analysis we can do in-house. We have a lab for that. We have all the, I mean, obviously, we, uh, some of the elements we can't uh, check. So we need to send them out. But uh, we get we can do some primary testing on the farm itself. The, the important elements so that we know where we stand. And um, for, the, for uh, the entire soil health, we send our uh, soils to accredited labs uh, in India to get back the reports. Uh, but that we do twice a year. But apart from that, things like the pH, um, dissolved uh, matter, organic matter, etc., that can be easily done on the farm itself. So these are some of the things that we do in-house. And finally, like I've been stressing for a while, there's been no chemical intervention for plant protection. Uh, this is again because what we're trying to do is we're trying to make the plant healthy from within. Uh, by giving the plant exactly what it wants. We don't want it to be overfed and then uh, or we don't want the plant to be uh, underfed and undernourished so that in both cases it is bad because an overfed plant is like a spoiled child uh, where um, it is highly susceptible to pests and disease attacks and an undernourished one is the same where uh, it cannot uh, express itself genetically and then is again prone to attacks from various crops. Uh, from various fronts, whether, whether it is a fungal infection, it could be insects, it could be um, other predators, or uh, even for that matter, um, uh, eating the leaf or, you know, those sort of things. So we, we try and ensure that the plant is healthy from within and healthy plants ensure that we have to do very minimal chemical intervention. Again, all these analysis that I've been speaking about have helped largely in ensuring that we have done no chemical intervention. If at all anything is required to be done, like if we do have an outbreak of, let's say, any one of the sucking pests, uh, we have our own um, um, our own uh, local um, organic concoctions using neem. Neem, as you know, is a very, very good uh, repellent uh, for insects. So we use neem and we use extracts of clove and cinnamon and those sort of things. So we have been using these products for a very, very, I mean, again, for the last four to five years, just to ensure that the quality is maintained at the highest level. And more importantly, the plant is able to express itself. We get extremely good, healthy cherries. And these healthy cherries are then finally able to give us some extremely uh, uh, good tasting coffees. So this has primarily been a journey that I undertook to ensure that the farm, which was uh, which I started 25 years back, where we were trying to um, kind of, let's say, push the envelope and make Robusta fashionable in the coffee world. And uh, today, from all these experiments that we've been able to do and trying to ensure that the quality is maintained and, uh, you know, taking away chemical intervention, going organic, ensuring that various, uh, you know, the, uh, let's say, the, the, the way the coffee is processed is as per the buyer. We have been able to achieve a lot of this. So, I mean, these are some of the steps that I've taken in making this farm art certified. Can I have the next slide, please? Um, again, uh, these are some of the other steps that we have done tremendously. Uh, I mean, we have improved on this tremendously. All our coffee is only hand harvested. We don't have any coffee which is machine harvested on my farm. We don't have machines at all for harvesting of coffee. We are very proud. It's selective picking. We do about three, sometimes even four uh, passes of a particular area because uh, the um, the coffees tend to ripen differently. And uh, so that was that is something that uh, we, we take great pride in. Like I said, we use a Brix meter to find out the uh, sugar content in the uh, bean. I mean, sorry, in the cherry. And if we are happy with the sugar content, then we are good to go in terms of harvesting. So we try and do minimum of three passes, sometimes even up to four. All the coffee is patio dried. We don't have any mechanical dryers. It's all on solar energy using the rays of the sun. 
Uh, we are also blessed that the harvest time in India coincides with uh, having uh, long hours of uh, sunlight, especially uh, December, January, February. We hardly have any cloudy days. So we are happy with the uh, patio drying and solar, uh, solar energy. There's no mechanical drying whatsoever. Uh, we recycle all the water, which, whichever is used in the coffee processing part of it, whether it is in the wet milling um, or in the patio, if at all we need to use water in the patio, um, sometimes just to clean the patio. I mean, it's not for processing of the coffee, but sometimes you need to wash the patio to keep it squeaky clean. So uh, even that water gets recycled. So any water which is anywhere in the uh, wet processing area gets recycled and we use it back in our farms by the drip irrigation method where uh, uh, by neutralizing, if it is acidic, we neutralize it and then we can use it back uh, and give it back to the plant. So that, that's, that's something that we've been doing for a while now. It's all uh, hand harvested, no machines. The only machines that we ever use are tractors to just bring in the coffee from the various points on the farm to uh the, the the central processing unit and uh, like i've been talking about we have very strict quality control and the quality control extends to every single part of the uh, processing that is right from harvesting to the way the coffee is brought in uh to the way the way we look at we do sorting we do hand sorting of the coffee at, at uh, before it goes into the machine so if if there are by default or by mistake some green beans have crept into the uh, coffee we try and ensure that that uh, green beans are hand sorted before they go in uh, for the wet mill and then again in the wet mill we have different machines which can sort out based on gravity as well as on uh, uh, the mucilage content what is the best coffee to be processed so very very strict quality control and uh, finally like i've been talking about the worker engagement and the community engagement is massive for us we have a workforce of close to 400 people on the farm. Uh, 200 are permanent workers and 200 are workers who join us uh, uh, during the harvest. And all 400 of them are always kept in, uh, let's say, uh, kept sensitized to what we are achieving as a farm and as a community, how we can help them and how they can help us. A lot of engagement with them, a lot of uh, events we support so that the workers are happy. We, we look after free education for every single child on the farm and various other uh, engagements we do which ensure that uh, uh, the worker and, and the community is happy and they, and the same workers, in fact, we have workers who have been with us for more than 30 and 40 years. So the same workers come back year after year and that itself is, is a huge plus for me because uh, once uh, somebody is motivated to work on your farm, you don't really have to keep um, you know telling them what to do because they're highly motivated, they come back and they are able to uh, you know, deliver the quality product that we finally want from them. Uh, the next slide, please. Um, like I said, it's, it's towards the end of my talk. So this has been the journey, what I tried in, the, in 25 minutes to tell you what we did in, in 25 years. But, the, but what, what drove me to do this, what drove me to do Robusta coffee, what drove me to do quality coffee was I needed to create a niche for myself and I realized that Robusta is the way forward. Um, it's just something that uh, came to me when I was looking at the various uh, statistics when we did the SWOT analysis. And um, like I said, probably if you ask me 25 years back, uh, would, you, would you have done, the, I mean, 25 years uh, ago, was this possible where we are today? I really don't know. It's been a journey. I've met a lot of people along the way. But I'm very happy and proud that a lot of them invested in Seturaman, invested in the idea of quality coffee because say 15, 20 years back, uh, people wouldn't talk about Robusta. You went to any of the shows, it was all Arabica. No one wanted Robusta, no one spoke about Robusta. If you spoke, you, you know, you had Robusta coffee, people were very, I, I won't say upset, but they would like look at you saying that, are you sure that you should even come to a show which is called Speciality Coffee because it's all Arabica and you know you don't have a place here. It's like you walk into a bar and then suddenly people start looking at you saying that do you belong here kind of thing. So it was it was unique, it was different, but uh, love the journey and uh, hopefully we can keep pushing those baby steps, take those one percent improvements, and uh, 
hopefully year on year our quality gets better i mean i am happy with the every year that we produced again this year what we cup uh, some of the coffees just last week uh, were tasting exceptional and uh, hopefully all of you all who are listening in and some of you all who may be buying setram and estate coffee continue supporting us and uh, thank you very much uh, for listening in great thank you very much nishant um i would just like to reiterate that yeah knowing your customers is a key thing in the coffee industry and having bought your coffees for um for for the past 8 years we never have an issue and it's such it's such an easy it's so, such an easy process for a coffee buyer when you have no issues ever <laughs> so it's um yeah yeah thank you for all your work that you do there you make my life a lot easier <laughs> so, <laughs> thanks um so we've uh, i think we'll go on to the um the questions that we've had come yeah. through so we'll start with the first one um which is from john thompson who i believe is in scotland if i have the right john thompson um he's, he asks um in the processing how does the measurement of processing metrics like ph and bricks differ to arabica uh like i said i, I i'm i'm not totally aware because we don't have arabica but i do know that the sugar content in uh, robusta is more um that's what i've been made to understand by by uh, talking to a few friends who who are in the specialty space of growing arabicas i know that the sugar content in um uh, sorry the ph in arabica is less it's more acidic um these are the broader pictures but i really wouldn't be able to tell you what what would be the exact uh, specifics for arabica versus robusta because we don't grow any arabica but um broadly uh, robusta is is a much more uh, let's say the mucilage is much thicker it's it's more difficult to process robusta as either a wash or a uh, or a honey because the mucilage is so thick and it tends to um, uh, let's say ferment much faster uh, so we need to be extremely careful when we do these coffees if you if if uh, during the washing process if some of the mucilage is left back on the bean it tends to ferment and you get this off taste fermented taste uh, which i'm sure phil you you've probably cupped on a few other coffees uh, where if it's not being washed well you know you tend to get a brownish kind of a tinge on those coffees mm. uh, so that that's primarily because of the um, mucilage and the fact that the sugar content is much higher uh, beyond that i really i don't want to speculate uh, because i I'm, i'm not very sure but we aim uh, for washed uh, coffees we aim for a bricks of 24 and above Uh, and for naturals, we aim for 28 and above. If if that uh, is a number that you're looking for, uh, I'm talking about the bricks meters uh, when we're looking at for the cherries. If it's 24 and above, then I'm I'm looking at it to make it a washed coffee. And if it's 28 and above, then I'm looking uh, to make it a natural coffee. Uh, but I'm not sure about what what an Arabica specialty uh, grow. Okay. Um... So we have another question saying as you have 50% of all um our certified coffees in the world do you often have farms contact you for advice Oh uh, yes absolutely in fact a uh, very interesting uh, question because i remember a few years back uh, when i was in in seattle in one of the scwa shows in fact i had a whole bunch of ecuadorian uh, robusta growers ecuador is suddenly growing or rather is trying to position itself as a specialty coffee producer if i'm not, or a robusta producer if i'm not mistaken and i had a whole bunch of uh, ecuadorian uh, growers who wanted to talk to me and uh, you know spent some time with them because uh, for them it was a new journey uh, because i think uh, the climatic conditions with, with ecuador being so close to the equator and you know having high uh, humidity and longer hours of uh, sunlight etc i think they were looking at the option of whether they could grow robusta versus arabica and there was a bunch of them were going down that path and they wanted to know how it was and how 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 profitable it was to be a specialty uh, robusta grower and what are the challenges that you face and so on so what so i remember talking to them i also remember talking to a lot of ugandan uh, coffee growers uh, robusta again uh, because uh, uh, like i said uh, uganda was at the forefront of this r certification movement and uh, i remember talking to some of them i i i myself have visited farms in brazil robusta farms to see uh, 
what what they are doing because uh, the productivity in some of these farms is absolutely through the roof. I visited farms in Vietnam as well as well as Indonesia. I mean, again, just to just to see around, uh, you know, where we can pick up a few tips maybe uh, to improve what we are doing. Uh, but yes, I mean, I do get now and then, especially at shows. I mean, I I I've not got uh, emails saying that you know how do we go about it, but especially at shows when you go. And meet in different shows. Uh, people are talking about it, and um, you know, um, I'm happy to share my knowledge and my journey to whoever wants to listen. Following on from that question, you say um, a lot of the shows you, you know, you struggled. People were struggling to understand why a robusta grow was at a specialty coffee expo exposition, but with like climate change and the difficulties facing the coffee industry. Do you believe that Q Robustas will have a more prominent position in the specialty of coffee? 100%. I mean, uh, I, I would probably say the future uh, definitely would be more on that because I think the world is ready for quality coffee. I mean, it doesn't have to be Arabic or Robusta. It's, uh, I mean, it's it's like uh, when I when you go into the market to buy a car, you you're spoiled. I'm talking about whether you're buying a Mercedes or a Jaguar or a Land Rover. It's purely your choice. Uh, so I can't say it's only a Jaguar or a Land Rover or a Mercedes, uh, whatever it is. So similarly in coffee, at the high end of the spectrum, it is purely on taste and purely on personal likes. So as long as it's quality and it meets certain parameters, I think quality coffee is definitely going to stay. Uh, challenges with climate change are there for both Arabicas and Robustas because Robusta doesn't like uh, very dry or uh, warm temperatures. Uh, so that could be a challenge going forward because uh, weather patterns are changing, uh, rainfall patterns are changing, we're getting either too much or too little uh, of rain. So that could be a challenge for Robustas. But like I said, to mitigate some of these risks, if we go back to our roots, if we go back to being uh, more eco-friendly, being more organic, having more shade trees, looking after the soil structure, looking after the health of the soil. I think we can mitigate some of the risk. I'm not saying we can mitigate most of the risk, but we can mitigate some of the risk. And I'm 100% sure that quality coffee, whether it's Arabic or Robusta, is definitely, definitely here to stay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely for anyone listening, if you haven't tried the Chance coffee, I suggest to cup it blind with a load of Arabicas and I'd be very surprised if you picked it out as a robusta. It's, um, yeah, it kind of messes up your brain when you think you, you've tasted yeah. a lot of coffees and then that comes about. It's quite, um, in, in fact, Phil, just, just to add, add to that, uh, we used to do earlier, I mean, uh, just, just like you correctly said, to mess up people's brains. So we used to throw in our robusta in a blind cupping with some of the Arabicas, uh, you know, in the SCAA when you had these blind cup tasting or specialty coffee things. So we used to throw it in and a lot of times people would pick our coffees and say this is probably the best coffee on the table. And when they knew it was a Robusta, some of these guys were absolutely horrified because they actually <laughs> picked the Robusta to be a, a, a good, I mean, the best on the table, you know. So, yeah, I mean, we have done that quite a few times. Yeah, it's always great to see their faces once they realize. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> So we have another question from Simon, and if, if it's the Simon we know, he's from England. Um, yeah. Sorry. So um, he asks, you say Robusta benefits from full sun, yet you have proved a great coffee can come from forested land. What would you say to other Robusta farms who use full sun? Uh, I would definitely say that plant more shade. Uh, primarily because shade is required by Robusta with the rising temperatures. One point number two, the soil health improves dramatically with the leaf litter and if you have fruit trees with the fruit that drop down, the, the soil structure and the soil health improves dramatically. And um, it's, it's like a highly symbiotic relationship between the trees, the coffee and the entire farm. So, it, uh, you know, uh, you, you get into this uh, thing of using more the minute you open it up, you need to give more water because you give it more water, you need to give it more uh, fertilizer because you give it more fertilizer, the plant is more susceptible to pests and insect attacks because it is susceptible to pests and insect attacks. It's like a dog catching its own tail. So you're you're never stopping with that. So sincere advice to anyone who's doing uh, shade grown coffee, I mean, uh, sun grown coffees, look at shade grown coffee because I think that's the future. 
especially in today's day and time with climate change absolutely being upon us and uh, it's our way of giving back to nature that's what i would definitely mm -hmm. definitely advocate great well i believe henry has a couple of questions as well so henry sure. pass the mic over the virtual I, mic I, yeah <laughs> yeah i would say Back to the, your blind cutting, I've actually a couple of times when we've cut free ships of uh, Sector Armin Estate, I've made like a blend for the office the next day and something like 15% and often people didn't couldn't tell that it was in blend and it was Arabic like key graders. So it's, um, it is a very fine coffee if you haven't tried um, Nishant's coffee yet. Um, I've got a question here from um, Nakul Mysore. And uh, he raises quite an interesting point about drying coffee. So in, especially in Arabica, everyone um, in the speciality industry uh, focuses on, on raised African beds. And Nakul said that um, in India, some people say that red fire bricks are more efficient for drying. Um, what are your thoughts? Uh, we have both on the farm. Uh, we use the, uh, the patio that is uh, the, uh, the uh, the bricks for, uh, especially for washed coffees. Uh, and we use uh, African beds mainly for our honey coffees. Uh, so it just depends. We, we, we've kind of uh, worked out saying that uh, this is what uh, works for a particular type of coffee. Um, I, I've noticed that, uh, I mean, um, with, with, with the raised beds or the African beds, uh, the constraint comes in, uh, in terms of space because uh, especially when you have in the peak of season, you need to have so many beds ready and uh, things like that. So if you're doing uh, honey coffee, it works extremely well. I, in fact, all the honeys are on African raised beds. Uh, some of our uh, naturals too, we try and do on uh, raised beds. But most of our washed coffees, we uh, put it out on the patio. Of course, before we put it on the patio, we put it out. Uh, we have like a pre-dryer where we have trays and we have a um, kind of like a fan which blows hot air from the bottom. Uh, it's more just to remove the moisture, the surface moisture, and then you put it out on the uh, on, on the patio because if you just put it as wet, it tends to grab some dirt or grime or whatever could be on the patio. So just to avoid that, maybe an hour or two we do uh, this, where we just have uh, electrical, I mean, uh, industrial fans blowing some hot air uh, through the coffee and then we put it out there just to remove the surface moisture. That's really interesting. And how long, obviously, like honey processed coffee, especially in Arabica, has become really famous in the speciality scene. How long have you been doing honey processing at Seth Um, uh, I probably, uh, we do small lots, but we've been doing it for probably the last seven, eight years. Um, we, we, I, I remember we had sent some uh, over to uh, uh, Wakefield as well. I think it was called Mandarin, if you all remember. It used to be called uh, Seth Raman Mandarin. So you'll do buy some of that. And we've been doing it for uh, for for a while. Um, again, all all pre-order because uh, honey is is a difficult coffee to make, and uh, we don't want to make and then be looking at uh, buyers. But yes, uh, robusta honey. Uh, we do have a few fair share of our friends who like like those coffees. I've got another question as well from um, this is from the same. I think Napoli Mysore has also said, can you describe Speciality robusta flavor notes, and so when you process it honey, how does that change the flavor notes for, for your coffee? Um, so if you've uh, cupped a, 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 a washed coffee, the very first thing is it's extremely clean. I mean, uh, robusta is known for its, uh, let's say, it's uh, a bit of uh, heavy body. Um, washed robustas are very clean. Obviously, my coffee is uh, very rich in chocolate and vanilla and a little bit of tropical fruit. Uh, some of the high-end coffees, especially if you have, uh, based on the varietal and the block that we have, some of them also have a hint of acidity, which is unique to Robustas, but my coffees do have, my washed Robustas do have a hint of acidity, uh, more of a lemony, uh, citrusy acidity. And um, uh, vanilla, chocolate, cinnamon, these are the very common flavors that you pick up with, with a lot of tropical fruit. So this is what a typical washed Setaraman Robusta should taste or will taste. Honey coffee is like a powder puff, uh, you know, like a sugar puff in your mouth. The minute you put it in your mouth, you're going to just get explosion of sugar in your mouth. That's the very first uh, 
uh, taste that you're going to get. And then obviously that taste lingers in your mouth for a very long time because of the fact that the mucilage, which I was just alluding to earlier, uh, the mucilage and the sugar content in Robustas are higher than Arabicas. So the entire sugar has been absorbed by the bean. So what you're going to cup is a large amount of uh, uh, sugar initially or the sweetness initially. And then the other taste profiles come through. Again, uh, peach, apricot are very common. Uh, what, what I have cupped, peach and apricot are two flavors that I typically pick up on my uh, coffees and uh, with a with a dash of maybe spices so these are these are the one but the most distinct flavor that you get in the honey is is the explosion of uh, sweetness the minute you put it in your mouth does it affect the body much in the flavor sorry does it affect the body the honey process uh the the washed coffee is more more light body i mean if you want to compare between the two uh definitely the honey would be a little bit more heavy body Yes. Nishant, we have one question from uh, Dom, and he would like to know uh, your go-to tactic in promoting Robusta to a specialty coffee shop. Um, yeah, and just uh, your, who still yeah, have my, their views of Arabica my, versus Robusta? What's your... My go-to, go typically what I would do is, I would never say it's a Robusta. I would just say I grow coffee. And invariably, when you say you grow coffee, everyone assumes you're an Arabica producer. So I would just go give them a bag of coffee and say, why don't you cup it or why don't you uh, put it in your machine and then let's do cupping. It's only when everyone's excited and everyone's talking and saying that, wow, you know, this coffee is really great and how do we go about it and, and you know, what's the next step? Then I kind of give them the curveball and say it's a robust start. So I never <laughs> ever would tell them it's a robusta because they're very biased. So honestly, a uh, lot of growers, I mean, sorry, a lot of cuppers would be biased because the minute you say it's robusta, they're already tasting the dirty uh, robusta characteristics, uh, which are normally uh, associated with the robusta coffee in their mind or what they've tasted in other origins. So I never tell them it's uh, robusta. I just tell them it's a bag of coffee and you, it's like a white light. So you play along with them saying that, it's coffee and they assume it's Arabica and then of course then you break the news to them. <laughs> We've got one more from Thierry as well. Um, he works at Dale Whitford and from Ivory Coast and uh, he's actually due to do a few robusta course uh, before coronavirus hit and he's asked um, due to the as you discussed like perception that robusta is inferior to Arabica um, you faced a lot of challenges early on with the farm. But when did you start getting demand for your products and when did you get the return on investment? Because you were fighting quite an uphill battle in the early days. Oh, interesting. Again, uh, I, I can't actually say when, uh, probably I'm fighting even today, to be honest with you, because it's not, not the fact of um, the, the fight is over. It's just that it's much easier now because uh, people recognize the coffees. I think the world has changed in the last especially the four to five years, because you're getting a lot of uh, roasters who are open to the idea of trying any coffee. In fact, some of them are, are, are even uh, trying speciality Liberica. Now, we do grow a few Liberica plants or Liberica trees on our farm, and some of them are looking at speciality Liberica. So people are open to try different coffees. I think, uh, uh, you know, the, the, the entire business being built on 100% Arabica is over, in my opinion. Like I said, Speciality coffee is here to stay. It's not speciality Arabica, no. So if you make good coffees, it is difficult in the world for you to get around there, but you have to be bullheaded. You have to spend a lot of your time and energy and obviously money. You have to travel. You have to kind of convince people. You meet good people along the way, like the Wakefield family, where uh, they kind of invest in you. And uh, then slowly the word starts spreading around. And obviously the R certificate, has helped because people when they get onto the website it's the same website as the Q certificate because i don't know if people have been on that the CQR website uh, all the coffees are listed so when people go and start seeing what are the coffees and curiosity sometimes they may swing by to the robusta side of things and look at what they are so you, so i do get some inquiries from from there as well but definitely uh, the certificate has helped because uh, um, you know when someone wants to change or wants to uh, start using Robusta. 
I guess a coffee which has some uh, certificate or an accreditation from, let's say, a quality lab like CQI, then they're more happy to try that out, you know, if, if at all uh, they want to go down that path. So these sort of things, but definitely quality, I would urge anyone who wants to grow Robusta, please grow quality Robusta. If you're just going to grow it as a commercial Robusta, you will suffer because there are countries which can produce far cheaper than you, and especially uh, India and some of the other countries struggle because our labor costs are going up, so many costs are going up, and now obviously we're in challenging times. So if we have quality on our, on our with us, we can definitely um, you know try and market these coffees and make a name for ourselves, which will help us come over these uh, challenges. So I definitely urge quality over anything else. I think um, that's probably the wrap for the talk today since we're just coming up to an hour. Um, just wanted to say thank you to Phil for, for moderating and thank you to Nishant for the fascinating talk. As always, it's a pleasure to hear about what you're up to at the farm um, and just the fact that you've been doing it for so long as well. It's something we don't shout about enough, so we'll, we'll be doing more of that um, over the next few months. Um, and I just wanted to alert the audience as well. Um, first of all, thank you for you all for your questions. Uh, we try to answer as many as we can and um, I know that it's obviously we're in very hard times so any donation is um, appreciated if possible but we are partnering with a, a beekeeping project in Peru as, as part of the full circle talks so if you're able to um, any donations appreciated I'm going to uh, post the, the links actually on your event right um, what I'm going to do now is I'm just going to send you the link in, just in case you haven't had a chance to see it. Uh, it's a really nice project um, in conjunction with the Cafe Camino Foundation and we're actually, the Cafe Camino Foundation are going to be talking tomorrow um, about Cafe Camino and the work they do out there. So um, if you if you're able to, um, we'd love to for you to attend on that as well. Um, but yeah, thank you very much from D.I. Wakefield. Thank you, Seth Rama States and we will speak to you soon. Thanks guys. Thank you so much for listening in and thank you to the Wakefield family for giving me this opportunity. It's been a wonderful journey for the last nine years and we hope to continue in this for many years to come. Thank you. Brilliant. Thank you, Nishan. Thank you. Yes. Cheers.